Thank you very much, Adam. Um, I think, um, as um, David Salisbury said earlier, um, you know, these are some meaty topics that um, on their own could take up the whole two weeks, um, let alone 25 minutes. So this will be really a little bit of a whistle top store tour of COVID-19 vaccine development. Um, but by way of introduction, just a few words about why, why I'm here, why, why we're, we're so involved in COVID-19 vaccine development. So CEPI was set up following the Ebola outbreak in West Africa in 2014, 2016, um, where it was really recognized that there needed to be a global organization that could respond um, to epidemics and pandemics in the future and ensure that there was equitable access to the vaccines that were developed. So we responded very early with the support of our funders um, supporting vaccine development and a number of enabling sciences. Uh, and some of those can be used um, by way of uh, examples as I go through the presentation. But I wanted to just start off with some facts and figures. Um, so these are up to date, I believe, as of yesterday, um, in terms of confirmed cases, over half a billion confirmed cases. We know that's just the tip of the iceberg but over 6 million deaths. But the next figure is really the most remarkable figure. If I was stood here at the last meeting that was a face-to-face -face meeting of, um, of ADVAC, um, I would have been laughed off the stage. There have been 11.7 billion doses of vaccine that have been delivered for COVID-19. That would have been considered impossible in the past. And in terms of vaccination, uh, nearly 60% of the world's, vaccine, uh, world's population has been vaccinated. Now we know that figure has a, a, a skew to high income countries, but again, a remarkable figure um, and shows how the whole vaccine community can come together in a crisis. So in the context of vaccine development, um, you know, this really happened. The first vaccines were developed within a year. Um, so all of those doses have only been delivered in an 18 month time frame, which is quite remarkable. And how, how is this done? I, I, we've seen some, some figures we've seen um, from Norman that, you know, usually you go through your preclinical phase one, phase two, phase three, you're staging your investments until you know whether the vaccine works. Um, but here, um, it was truly an accelerated um, effort. And we, at CEPI, we, we did a number of interviews um, across the whole vaccine development community um, to really look at where were the innovations that took place to allow us to really get from that point of a sequence to vaccines being licensed in under a year. And you can see here, the timelines are really quite incredible with, um, uh, several factors being really important in the speed while still gathering um, safety and efficacy data to allow those vaccines to be used. I think one of the first things to say is that um, a lot of things were done in sequence, in, in, in parallel rather than in sequence, and really required some at-risk financial investment, in particular for manufacturing. So we were seeing manufacturers manufacturing doses of vaccine that could be used even before they had a preclinical proof of concept. And that level requires a high level of financial risk to be taken. One, one point here in those vaccines that all got to, to use very early are really all of the organizations and the platforms that had been working on looking at rapid response for some time. The mRNA vaccines and the vector vaccines already looking at how to validate their platforms um, and really hit the ground running. There were some innovations through the clinical phases, um, again, really not going through phase one, two, and three, working very closely with the regulators. Um, with regular reviews to really accelerate the development, but still being able to deliver very large databases of over 30,000 subjects. Again, through innovation of understanding clinical trial networks that could rapidly be utilized um, for the development. 
And finally, that rolling review process with the regulators who were willing to review data as it was becoming available to make that process as, as little as five weeks, which could take anything up to 18 months otherwise. So some, some real innovations there. Then maybe just a few words um, from some examples in terms of um, what CEPI has done in terms of funding and facilitating development. This slide shows you um, CEPI's vaccine portfolio. So before the COVID-19 pandemic hit, we were working with partners on a number of vaccines for our priority pathogens. One of those was MERS. So we were really gathering information about coronaviruses and also working on disease X platforms such as mRNA. Um, so we were able to really bring those two elements together with existing partners so that we had partnership agreements funded within two weeks of the sequence being identified. And then this next slide shows some of the elements that need to come together for rapid response in a pandemic situation. I mentioned bringing together work on other coronaviruses with rapid response platforms, which allowed several partners to hit the ground running. And we established one of the largest portfolio of vaccines across a number of um, platforms and approaches. And I'll come back to that later. We all think that vaccines work at this point in time. When we were back in January, February, March of 2020, we knew very little about COVID-19. And so the approach taken was to really look at three key elements, looking at speed of manufacture, at speed of development, scale of manufacturing, and obviously ensuring access to the vaccines to the populations who need them most. Another important point to move forward quickly is to think of how to harmonize as much as possible the assessments of COVID-19 vaccines. We had a number of initiatives from central immuno immunology labs, and we have Valentina here who's headed that effort as one of the, the participants here, and she'll be able to tell you a lot more about that. Animal model networks, clinical trial networks formed to really look at how we can accelerate the development. We are now in an environment of variants and tracking the variants and understanding the impact of variants on the effectiveness of vaccine is, vaccines is critical as the virus still remains one step ahead of us uh, in terms of its evolution. And as we move forward, the understanding that we should be developing more broadly protective approaches for the future. All of this coming together um, we are a member of COVAX. You heard from Aurelia this morning from Gavi. So CEPI is the R&D and manufacturing arm of COVAX. And through our support, through procurement and through donations, um, COVAX has been able to deliver just over 1.4 billion doses of vaccines to 145 economies. So I want to focus in terms of the R&D a little bit on the science and the two key factors that came together to allow uh, vaccine developers to be successful. And they are, what are the use of the platform and what is the antigen design um, that, that you need to use um, to develop a vaccine? So this is really a summary by vaccine platform of um, several critical attributes to use in a pandemic such as COVID-19. So speed of, of, um, of um, of development and manufacturing, the cost of manufacturing, the scalability, how many doses can be, can be made. And we know that here we're talking about being able to have the capacity of billions of doses of vaccines. And then the stability and the storage temperatures. So RNA was really recognized as a rapid response platform, but at the beginning of the pandemic, um, it was an unproven platform for infectious diseases and the scale was still relatively limited. And so it was still considered as a high risk platform. Viral vectors, um, we have first vaccines for viral vectors that, that have been licensed. And again, they have been shown that um, speed um, is, is a strong attribute of viral vectors and with lower cost of goods compared to mRNA. But as with um, mRNA, some work to be done in terms of storage temperatures and stability. 
proteins um, and uh, virus-like particles are really a number of vaccines on this technology have been very successfully introduced, have a good safety profile and efficacy profile. But these are slow to produce. And we have seen that, that we now only have one um, um, protein-based vaccine, the Novavax vaccine, is now licensed. This was supported by CEPI, but shown that that process is much, much longer, although it has several advantages of the scalability and um, the cold chain requirements. Inactivated vaccines, um, we've seen inactivated vaccines being um, of, of relative speed, um, and live attenuated vaccines can often give a very good response, but are very slow to develop. And we're a long way away from having a live attenuated vaccine for COVID-19 at a point to consider for license. The second key element is the antigen that you're going to choose, the immunogen. And you will see from, from all of the vaccines that have been licensed to date, they have chosen the full length spike protein this is the protein that the virus uses to attach to the cell and infect and produces strong neutralizing antibodies. There has been quite a lot of debate of should you be using the full length spike or the receptor binding domain as your immunogen. And um, there's some concern with RBD potentially that there may be less broadly protective is not something that we've seen at this point in time, but they do potentially have some additional benefit in the context of more potent neutralizing antibodies and also lower cost. So then this slide really um, puts two parameters together. Um, first of all, on the y-axis, this is the data from the early efficacy trials for a number of different vaccine candidates where you see the efficacy of the vaccines all of which were shown to be beneficial in terms of protection against COVID-19. It is difficult to really uh, put one aside another without having them in the same clinical trial. They did not all have the same case definition, um, but all shown to be efficacious. But then if you plot against that, the neutralizing antibody titers that are generated from, um, from these same clinical trials, you're seeing that there is a good association between neutralizing antibody and efficacy when you're looking here at the, um, at the Wuhan strain. So with that, yeah. So then as well as looking at immunogenicity and efficacy of the vaccines, what about the safety profile of the vaccine? Please don't try and read each individual piece here. It's just really looking at the trends that you have here depending on the platform that you're using in the vaccine. And you do see some variability in terms of the reactogenicity. Here you're seeing the local adverse um, events um, that have been reported in clinical trials. Again, one caveat, they may not be using exactly the same parameters, but you can see some variability there um, with the mRNAs being reactogenic, but within the limits of what you have seen in the past from, from other vaccines and some others clearly less uh, reactogenic. And then looking at systemic events, Again, very complex, but the, the idea here is to get the general trends for the different platforms um, that, that um, have been developed um, and the data. So with this as well, um, you know, the data from here is from well-controlled clinical trials. With safety, you need to continue to monitor safety through, through, you know, throughout the lifespan of the vaccine. And you do see rare events. And there are some platform specific rare events that have emerged through COVID-19 with the adenoviruses through thrombotic events and through the mRNA vaccines as an example through myocarditis. So there are evaluations that are ongoing here to understand what component is this is related to the platform potentially or what component potentially is related to the platform and or the, um, the antigen or the immunogen. A specific note on mRNA. So really mRNA, I think we can say is a validated platform for COVID-19 with the licensure of two vaccines from Moderna and from Pfizer-BioNTech. 
and is really shown its ability for speed in a pandemic situation. However, there are challenges that remain with the technology and more work is needed to lower the cost of goods, to look at more thermostable um, formulations. Um, there have been problems with limitations of raw materials um, and um, manufacturing has largely been in the North, although there are now many efforts to expand the manufacturing across, across the various continents of the world. And there's also a question of what is the durability of the mRNA vaccines. Um, it, a lot of data is being generated in association with the variants and, and questions on how long um, the immune response will last. So there are potentials there for um, additional improvements in mRNA. And there are other technologies such as self-amplifying RNA, which could also um, further develop the technology. So one of the key um, components that we're all living with today is the emergence of variants and the importance of what is the impact of variants on the effectiveness of vaccines. So um, this is what we've seen in terms of the emergence of variants of concern. Obviously what we're saying here is where these uh, variants were first identified and I think this is largely due to the, the good surveillance mechanisms that, that exist in these countries that really first picked up these variants. But you've seen over time that we have had five variants of concern. When you look at the cartography um, of these variants of concern, um, I think you know, there are three things that you need to consider. First of all, what is the impact on the infectivity? Um, so how infectious is the virus? And we have seen that Omicron is far more infectious than the other variants or the original virus. What is the pathogenicity of these variants? So how severe is the disease? And as I said before, what is the impact um, on the effectiveness um, of the vaccines? So you can see here different variants um, with different um, um, cartographies which will um, result in different um, attributes to the, each of those variants of concern. So how do we actually address variants with vaccines? Again, please don't take this slide literally. This is supposed to, to, to make a specific point here that a comparison was done looking at primary series vaccination and the fold reduction in neutralizing antibodies um, for any vaccine platform according to the variant. And you can see whether it's with the primary series or following booster vaccination, that by far the Omicron variant has a much higher fold reduction in neutralizing antibody. And it's important to understand what impact this will have on the efficacy of the vaccines. The next slide is just a snapshot of um, effectiveness data that exists from one of the vaccines. So this is from the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, looking at um, different severities of disease in different age groups, um, looking at effectiveness after the primary series and effectiveness after the booster vaccination. So for severe disease, it did appear um, that there was um, uh, some reduction in efficacy against severe disease with the primary series vaccination. But we're getting back to the levels of um, protection against severe disease once a booster vaccine was um, administered. The duration of this obviously needs to be looked at very carefully. And, and looking at um, symptomatic disease or disease of any severity, really some reduction in terms of or less um, effectiveness um, against any um, infection or symptomatic disease. So what does this mean for vaccine development? Um, what are the approaches that we should take as the, the variants emerge and, and probably will continue to evolve over time? So there are several approaches to vaccine development that you can take, and these can either be very short term um, and um, sort of low risk to, to, to long term high risk um, um, initiatives to, to look at having a more broadly protective approach. 
Obviously, optimizing the use of current vaccines, and this is largely through the regimens that are used. Um, so primary series, booster, mix and match. Um, there's a lot of good data that suggests that a mix and match regimen gives you a broader immune response than using the same vaccine multiple times. There are a number of people working on variant vaccines of the versions of the current vaccines, either as a strain adaptation or as bivalent vaccines. And then there are initiatives looking at more broadly protective uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccines or variant proof vaccines that will protect against all variants and potential future um, variants. And then really looking at the holy grail, looking at broadly protective uh, beta coronavirus vaccines. So not just existing coronaviruses such as SARS, MERS, SARS-CoV-2, but potentially protecting against newly emerging um, coronaviruses that may spill over um, from an animal reservoir. Just to touch on the first two um, aspects specifically, this is just a graphic that actually really summarizes some data that I showed on a previous slide, that if indeed um, neutralizing neutralization potency is a good measure of vaccine effectiveness, you can see here that the heterologous um, regimens are likely to produce more potent neutralizing antibodies and really a combination of, um, of vaccination and infection gives you the best and more, most broadly um, protective approaches. And then what about working on variant vaccines? So this is a summary of data on the um, variant vaccines that we are aware of. Um, this is based on data in the public domain. Um, you can see that Omicron has really triggered a new wave of variant um, um, vaccine development, whether that might be a monovalent vaccine. So we have seen, for example, the mRNA vaccines developing um, variant vaccines, but also some efforts to develop bivalent vaccines um, as well. So really the question is, is this the type of vaccine uh, which should be used um, in the future um, if we see new variants continuing um, to emerge? But then looking at the more broadly protective approaches. So CEPI, but also NIAID um, uh, are investing in, with uh, developers in developing broadly protective SARS-CoV-2 and broadly protective beta coronavirus vaccines. We're here really looking at approaches that could be multivalent, mosaic, chimeric approaches, looking at conserved epitopes, um, looking at the breadth of the immune response specifically to really um, develop much more broadly protective approaches. These are all very much in early development at the moment and technology wise are very challenging, but potentially could be the vaccines of the future. So with that in mind, um, a huge amount has been um, achieved, but there are many challenges that remain in the context of uh, future COVID-19 vaccines. Durability of protection, booster strategy. What is the clinical evidence that we will have uh, to support any policy decisions on, on booster vaccination. So more data needs to be generated on the duration and the impact of, of booster vaccination. Uh, the continuing evolution of variants, the importance of looking at the impact of variants on vaccine effectiveness. Licensure pathways for new vaccines. The majority of populations now are no longer naive and the majority of the population in the world have received a primary vaccination series. So vaccine developers are now looking at developing booster only vaccines. And what are the regulatory pathways to develop booster only vaccines? And what are we trying to protect again? What we have seen is that protection remains good against severe disease with the vaccines that we have. But should we be looking for vaccines that can prevent infection, transmission, symptomatic disease, or just uh, severe disease and death? The, the, the less severe you go, the, the larger the challenges there. So for example, what is, the, what is the potential benefit of looking at intranasal vaccines as a way to get mucosal immunity, which could be more transmission blocking 
is one area that could be considered. So with all of this in mind and really looking to the future, um, this really summarizes um, what happened with COVID-19. It was really quite unprecedented. From the identification of the sequence back in January 2020 to the first use of the vaccine, which was Pfizer, BioNTech, very closely followed by Moderna and Oxford AstraZeneca, it only took 326 days for that first use of a vaccine. At that point in time, already there were 1.6 million deaths. So the real challenge is what if we could have done that in 100 days when there are only 200,000 deaths? How much more of an impact could vaccines have had? So I'll leave you with that question. That is a question that CEPI is trying to address in CEPI 2.0. So then just a few concluding remarks. So I'm seeing Adam arriving, so this is at just the right time. So COVID-19 development has moved forward at really unprecedented speed and taking advantage of novel um, rapid response platforms and uh, antigen design. Monitoring of variants is going to be critical as we move forward to monitor the effectiveness of the vaccine and give views as to how to use vaccines in the future and development of more broadly protective um, approaches is underway. So the trajectory though of the pandemic is still unclear and highlights the need to continue with vaccine R&D. And just one last slide. So I did want to take the opportunity. I know you like the dog, don't you? <laughs> just to introduce, I know you're all introducing uh, yourselves later on, but to introduce Valentina and Christine, so our two, um, um, uh, participants in, um, in, in, in ADVAC this year. So Valentina leads the um, immunology, um, uh, immunology is head of um, laboratory sciences. So, and um, leads the um, um, centralized laboratory network where we actually offer the opportunity for all developers free of charge to have some samples tested on well, um, on validated assays, including with variants, and Christine Rose, who is the R&D chief, chief of staff, and who has been really instrumental in um, a broad range of topics around R&D for COVID-19 and COVAX. So they are great resources to you for questions on COVID-19. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you for an extremely uh, clear summary. Uh, we've learned a lot. Questions? You can choose. Oh, right. Okay. So <laughs> we go right right at the end. Hi, yeah. Fabio Bagnoli, just gave, thank you for your great presentation. The, the, uh, in, there are multiple uh, ways for, you know, a potential increase in the, uh, you know, dose pairing, improving the dose pairing and um, uh, also increase uh, thermal stability such as, you know, skin delivery patches, you know, now the, that kind of uh, technology is evolving pretty fast. Have you considered that, that option? Um, so that the, those sparing is an important factor to consider for a number of areas. Um, we know at the moment, probably vaccine supply is not an issue, but we don't know, you know, we, we can't say that forever, but, but also from a safety perspective, actually, there might be some interest also to look at dose bearing, to look at the reactogenicity from a safety perspective. Um, so in terms of dose bearing, I think, yes, it is important. Actually, we have had a call for proposal in CEPI to look at um, uh, fractional dosing um, for booster vaccinations um, to really get, gather some evidence there. Um, I think your second point is, is things like patches. Yeah. Because uh, the skin delivery through patches through micro needles can yeah. actually you know reduce dosage, increase uh, uh, thermal stability, and potentially is an easier way to administer the vaccine. Yeah. It is, and I think that is an area to look at. The one piece that we don't have with patches yet at this point is the scale, and that is something that would need to be worked on with. With, with patches specifically, but the thermal stability, I think thermal stability is an area that really needs to be, um, you know, 
looked at for the current vaccines and future vaccines. It is really um, critical because the increased cost um, associated with not being able to use the standard mechanisms is, is huge. Um, that's an area that SEPI is looking at. We actually, I think it's closed now, but had a call for proposal for looking at innovations in, in thermostability to think about how it can make some improvements for the future to, to allow for, for the usual, you know, usual cold chain to be used in the future. So, yeah. Hi, I'm Daniel from Brazil. Um, I know that speed is key, especially in pandemic scenario. But it brought some um, obstacles. Many people don't want to vaccine because vaccine were produced too quick, etc. So, from the clinical perspective, I'm a pediatrician working in the field. Uh, do you think that this? And I'm not talking about the pandemic scenario. Okay, outside pandemic scenario. Do you think that this accelerated uh, vaccine production, as mentioned in the last slide, could jeopardize the? Um, public confidence in vaccines in the long term? Yeah, I, th that, that is a, a very good question. Um, when you look at speed, um, I think you have to look at the situation. It's, it's, it is down to the benefit risk assessment. The benefit has to outweigh the risk. And there may be certain circumstances in a pandemic, which is actually much worse than COVID-19, where it is very legitimate to move very quickly with relatively limited data. With, with a caveat there that a lot can be done in advance of a pandemic, working on a platform, working on similar viruses to build data that, that, that give some level of reassurance. Um, I, I do think the vaccine confidence area is really broad and it should be starting very early on in the clinical development. Um, and requires expertise across social sciences as well as um, the, the sort of more biological sciences um, to help, you know, tackle that and um, understand what really, you know, the, the, the concerns are in relation to vaccines. But it's, it's a very prominent topic. Um, my name is Elke, I'm from Switzerland. I was wondering whether you have looked into long COVID as a as a disease. Um, it, it is a lot of debate, at least in Switzerland, that this can be a quite a social burden and also burden on individuals because they cannot work for sometimes months or even a year. And is that something that that is 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 that something where vaccines help, or is that where you have evidence for vaccines that can prevent this or at least lessen the burden? Yeah, and we have certainly in the sort of vaccine development. Um, programs, you know, in clinical development, probably the sample size is, is too small to really understand the impact of, of vaccination on long COVID. Um, probably others might know more data than I do actually on through effectiveness as to whether or not there's a good data set that, that suggests that vaccines can reduce, uh, you know, the burden of, of long COVID. Obviously, preventing if we can prevent infection, then we can prevent long COVID, but, but there are obviously breakthrough infections and probably do need some more data to see whether there is, you know, what the impact is there. Yeah. Hi, when you mentioned some of your um, prospective vaccines, such as those for uh, uh, broadly protective beta coronavirus, how do you plan to approach the regulatory aspect of that? So. Thank goodness we don't have yet another coronavirus in circulation right now. So is it a, a develop the platform and then wait? Are you considering human challenge studies? Are you, you know, what's the approach that SEPI is taking for those kinds of broadly protective vaccines? And, and, and this is actually an approach that, we, you know, we actually want to work together with, um, with NIAD on this. Um, and um, I was talking to Emily earlier about this to, to, as, as we're both developing those vaccines, it, it's really critical to have the discussions with regulators now, even if there's no key pathway. There's a lot that you can do from preclinical models um, and looking at protection in animals and potential correlates in animals, and then looking to see how that could reasonably predict you know, what you would likely to see in protection in, in humans. Um, and we have examples of vaccines that have been licensed on that basis. Um, 
and you have the expert here in, in terms of Kirsten from um, from um, J and J, where where you can get to a license because there isn't enough disease to show the efficacy. So you need to look at those types of approaches. You can look at human challenge studies as well. I, I think the critical question is: is that a a challenge study against infection or against disease, what, what does that look like? But these are all discussions that should be had with the regulators at a very early stage um, and the scientific community in general. So um, there isn't a clear pathway at the moment, um, but um, that shouldn't stop us getting started. And actually the best way to have a discussion with regulators, and I'm sure Norman would agree, is to have data to present. Um, so generating data, generating the preclinical data and looking at the next step is, is, is where to start. Yeah. More questions? I can't believe it. I mean, oh, yes. Sorry. I've never <laughs> come across an ad back audience not asking questions. <laughs> I'm a bit far away from the mic, so I'll just shout. Maheshi from, from England. And I, I, it's, I love the idea of a, of a hundred day start to finish developing a, a vaccine from a, from start to, to, to getting it out there. Um, but there's a lot of work that needs to go before that in terms of surveillance and diagnostics. You know, so you identify the next epidemic, you know, so you can crack on and figure out what it is you make, need to make a vaccine to. How does CEPI get involved with that, with engaging people in terms of surveillance and, and, and identifying the next threats? Yeah, and, and we are not in the business of surveillance. Um, that, that, that is clear, but we do connect with those in the business of surveillance. So there are a lot of organizations that are really looking at spillover events, you know, have detailed knowledge of viruses in, in zoonotic viruses. Um, so we have a working group, for example, really working with those folks to think about, you know, what, what are the viruses that are most likely to spill over? Um, and actually one of the key elements there is what is the receptor that the virus is using in the animal and how similar is that to the human receptor? Those types of viruses perhaps are more likely to spill over. So we really need to understand the biology very carefully and look at trends in terms of surveillance. So very much in terms of connection there. What we're doing specifically is developing virus family vaccine libraries. So take a virus family, so let's say coronaviruses, and sample viruses from each of the genera um, and develop vaccine candidates from those. They might be some animal candidates, they might be human candidates and really understand what is the optimum antigen design, what sort of immune response you get from there. So we're looking at a number of different ways to be better prepared. And I think the point you made you need to be prepared is, is the critical piece. There's a lot that you can do pre-pandemic to be better prepared. I think there's a question over in the corner oh, there. Yeah. The back. the back, okay, sorry. I was... Thank you so much. First of all, I'd like to thank you for your nice presentation. I'm Dr. Tanvi from Bangladesh. Uh, I'd like to ask that I was wondering whether SEP is looking at to explore correlates of protection in terms of you know vaccine against different kinds of variants of uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so, is there any work going on regarding this issue? Thank you. So there, there are two areas that, that can really help here, and um, Valentina can talk to you a little bit more about our uh, central lab network that does the immunology for COVID-19, offers some standard assays so that people can test their samples um, on those standard assays. And obviously that can help contribute to developing correlates of protections. Um, the other things that we're looking at are things like some systems immunology, um, to really have an in-depth analysis in terms of the immune response. And importantly there, working with, um, with partners who have samples from clinical efficacy trials, and that, that's really the critical area. So in COVID-19, yes, we're working there. And as I said before, there's also a lot you can do in preclinical work, looking at, at, at um, potential correlates in, in animal models to give you some indication before you move in, into, into human clinical trials as well. So correlates are really important, especially if you want to move um, quickly through the regulatory process to give the regulators sufficient data 
um, to suggest reasonable um, 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 evidence of efficacy. Um, uh, thank you very much. So I'm Anthony from Ghana, and um, we've had some very interesting conversations today from the faculty concerning the vaccine manufacturing and how we've uh, solved to a large extent problems of access uh, funding to make sure that um, vaccines are produced available to the people who need it the most. Now, perhaps some of these stakeholder set up um, at the time looked at access, looked at funding, uh, looked at manufacturing to solve this problem. And there's an extra one that has recently come up. And this is that the people who need vaccines the most are not getting them because of vaccine hesitancy, um, perhaps conspiracy theories and rejection for that matter. This is not a problem only in developing economies, but also in developed economies. My question is that, what will be the best approach moving forward? Are stakeholders um, going to pretend that because we are advocacy and policy and scientists, we don't want to concern ourselves with communication. And so we're going to, you know, just leave that part, produce over 2 billion doses of vaccines that nobody's really taking, or do we have plans to begin to integrate these um, concerns as part of our focus so that as much as we are providing funding, as much as we are providing studies and, and the vaccines itself, we are also considering how we can get the vaccines to the people who are saying no to the vaccines, but who really need the vaccines? Thank you. And that is such a good question. Um, I'm an R&D person, so I can look at things from the R&D side. The social science piece is, is important. And at lunch today, I was speaking to a gentleman from Togo and the, you know what the challenges were in Togo sp specifically. And I think everyone has their own, you know, that there are different nuances. You cannot treat vaccine hesitancy as a, you know a single thing that can be dealt with through a certain communication but from the r d eyes i think one of the critical pieces is do the clinical trials where you want to use the vaccine as the very beginning to have that community participation in those clinical trials really connect with um you know the public health uh, institutes in the countries as a starting point, but it, it really does need to be an integrated approach. And I, I don't think we're there yet. We move forward with such speed here that, you know, we didn't know what data we were going to get until we got it. It's actually quite difficult to prepare, um, but, but it certainly is something I think we all need to do better in the future. There's some questions down here. Yeah. Okay. My name is Abiola from Nigeria. I was in Denmark last month, and I heard that during the COVID pandemic, they killed all the minks because they had COVID. So I was thinking that the CP, as CPA, do they also think of animal vaccines? It's just, instead of just giving human beings, if there were dogs that had the COVID, would they have killed all the dogs in the country? Yeah, I mean, one health approach is, is quite relevant. So we have a number of priority pathogens. MERS is another one, which actually is a disease of camels. Uh, and, you know, it just, just we, we are the sort of secondary in, in infected. We have Rift Valley fever as another one that, that we're working on. Um, so our approach is to be as aligned as possible with the veterinary vaccines. One of the challenges that we have is veterinary vaccines are made under different requirements. Um, they have to be very, very cheap to be used um, and a justification to be used. Um, so you know, we've looked at things like, could you use one facility to manufacture both human and veterinary vaccines? The answer is yes, but it would be the human facility, and then that would not make, make the animal vaccine viable. Um, so I think the answer is to be as aligned as possible. It's exactly the same for influenza, as an example. How can we think with, with um, you know, the... Um, the avian influenza about how better to, to have a more integrated approach, but having to recognize the differences and the nuances um, that come between those two. Right, we're actually at time now for the break. So please send your question through to Romina and she'll get it through. Um, if you want to enroll in my uh, observational study of weight gain during the ADVAC course, <laughs> uh, you can see me afterwards and there'll be some delicious snacks for you now the next session starts in half an hour. Thank you very much. Great.